Our goal is to build intelligent machines to help people in their daily lives. What makes us intelligent is our ability to learn. And this is what we are trying to do with these machines. And to some extent, we get inspiration from biology. What we can do with current technology is build networks of simulated neurons on the order of magnitude of the brain of a, of a mouse, let's say. So, the way we train our machine, we show a bunch of images of, say, breeds of dogs, and for each image, we tell it what it is. We want the machine to be able to learn to perform the tasks. The more we show them example, the better they can. And what's very interesting is that after a while, it can do this with new dogs never seen before. It's able to exhibit superhuman performance on a particular task. So, how can we help the post life with this? somebody to describe it to you, even having like three words just helps flesh out all the details that I can't see. I feel like I can fit in and there's more I can do. I can just call my mom like, yay, I, I saved your picture. And she'll be like, what? She was like, how do you see it? Because my phone read it to me. It's new. <laughs> and I'm going to mess with my mother head so much. <laughs> in the future, we'll be able to give a complete description of the image. The two people are happy, they're sad, they're holding hands with one another. It's this kind of comment that a human would make. We have systems in the lab that are able to do this, and they will be deployed over the next few years. Artificial intelligence systems are going to be an extension of our brains, the same way cars are an extension of our legs. They're not going to replace us, they're going to amplify everything we do, augmenting your memory, giving you recent knowledge, and they're going to allow us to concentrate on doing things that are properly human. So that was just one example of uh, how we are using AI research in the wild to help uh, uh, the billion users uh, who are using Facebook, some of them who are blind actually. So the mission for Facebook AI research is simple. Uh, we are trying to develop technology that give people super superpowers to communicate better, to understand the world around them in a better way. And in that process, we want to understand intelligence and make machines that are intelligent. So these are very broad uh, goals and very challenging goals, but that, that is what uh, the agenda for Facebook AI research is. So today, I want to just touch base on one subtopic uh, that we are tackling in the, in the lab, uh, which is on computer vision. Uh, this is going to be very uh, high level, uh, very you know, non-technical part. If you are really interested in the publications or in the technical parts of this talk or the systems that we build, uh, research.facebook.com will have all the information, the papers, the blog posts, some of the code, uh, the models. So please feel free to uh, chime in there and uh, get information there. So in computer vision, the way I see it, there are three main things. Uh, the goal is obviously to unlock information from visual content. And we'll get to what I mean by that. Uh, we also want to, over time, deepen the level of understanding. What we mean by understanding today might be very simple tomorrow. That's been the case so far, uh, if you look back. And finally, uh, if you look at the current systems, you need to provide a lot of supervision uh, to these models, to these uh, methods. The idea is to get to, <laughs> with all the obstructions in the world, get to the final solution. Okay, so let's let's look at each of these uh, flows. What do, what do I mean by unlock information from visual content? So visual content can be in the form of images, can be in the form of video, uh, can be RGBD or LiDAR data, which is three-dimensional. You want to uh, build building blocks for processing all these types of content uh, if you're a computer vision group. Uh, what, 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 what do I mean by level of understanding? Uh, 
Uh, obviously, it starts with a very simple task of classification, which is telling what is in the image or video. But then you go into detection, which is basically drawing a bounding box around uh, uh, this object or uh, uh, whatever uh, is the instance. Then you get to segmentation, which is uh, labeling each pixel, whether this pixel belongs to grass or sky or water. And finally, uh, to also get to semantic segmentation, uh, which is, uh, this is sheep one, sheep two, man one, uh, man two, and so on. Now, obviously I'm stopping here, not because the, there is not enough space. Uh, this is how we are looking at it today, but as we get better at understanding this, this will go to the most basic stuff, and then there will be more and more advanced things that we will do. But just to give you an idea, from left to right is the maturity of the system uh, when it understands this content. Then there is level of supervision, uh, which is uh, you basically tell the system that this is a cat. This is millions. There are here. Here are thousands of examples of cats, dogs, and so on. And then the system learns to identify. Then there is the other uh, realm, which is weakly supervised, where you don't explicitly say what is in the image, but just give implicit information like hashtags that people use on social networks or descriptions that they write. And you would still want to use this somehow uh, to understand the visual world. And finally, uh, an unsupervised world where you're just given raw data and no other information, and the system and the system is just observing. This. It understands that uh, a dog could look like a mop, or a dog will bark, and so on. So it looks at uh, thousands or millions of such videos, and it builds representations about the world. So from left to right, you have different kinds of uh, supervision. So how does it all work right now? If you uh, observe in the first video that I showed, currently the system uh, systems that work really well uh, start with millions of annotations uh, where you take a class and you give multiple examples of a class and you do that for many, many classes. You take all of these annotations and you train a deep neural network with many neurons in it where neuron is a weight that you're learning. And then whatever model you get, you do a large scale deployment and then you have a fully functional uh, machine learning uh, system, and in this case, a computer vision system. Now, Facebook uh, has a stream of data coming in. So here are some examples where the system has a classified fireworks, or living room, or pizza, or guitar. And uh, this is just one example. You can actually extrapolate to videos. So here, in this case, each of the video is actually a channel. Uh, this is all public data. And that's a sunrise channel, or sunset channel. This is a dog channel, flower ocean or however you want, like whatever channel, right? The idea here is you have a stream of data that gets classified and uh, you can build content-based uh, channels, both in photos and videos. So we had one more challenge, which was can we identify 487 different kinds of sports? I certainly couldn't when we started the project, but our system can now with a pretty good amount of accuracy. So here uh, on the top are the predictions from the existing uh, sport classification system. Initially, the sports are pretty easy, but as you go later, this is it's recognizing different types of skating, six different types. And then uh, it, you'll see that it recognizes hockey, various types of hockey. That is non-trivial for us unless we read the description or we see many videos. And there are obviously some uh, really arcane sports like uh, uh, mountain cycling, which I don't recommend you do. So, uh, Again, the, the goal here was to kind of emphasize this point that the current systems have superhuman capabilities already, but they are specific to a task. So in this case, it was uh, specific to sport classification. In the first case that we saw, it was specific to recognizing the breed of a dog. But eventually, what we want is a system that uh, helps us in not just one specific task, but many tasks. So these are all good prototypes. Uh, these are all things that where we saw things working. How do we really apply these computer vision models at scale, uh, at Facebook scale, and help uh, help bridge, help connect people, right? So one obvious. Wonder what it's like to use Facebook if you are not able to see. Turn on your sound to experience it. Screen readers like this one read aloud what's on the screen, making Facebook accessible to the millions of people worldwide who can't see. And now Facebook's new technology can tell them what's in the photo. Facebook, search. What's on your mind? 
Shayoma Iwu, March 6 at 10.14 p.m. With my college buddies in my favorite place. Ready for a great weekend. Photo. Image may contain. Tree. Sky. Outdoor. Demetric Sanders and seven others reacted. Man on her pallery. March 6 at 7.48 p.m. Sunday night splurge. Photo. Image may contain. Pizza food. You and 17 others reacted. 13 comments, 2 shares. Peter Cuddle, March 6 at 4.22 p.m. We finally made it. Photo, image may contain. Two people, smiling, sunglasses, sky, outdoor, water. Ask by the wall and 29 others reacted. Facebook's mission is to connect the world. And that goes for everyone. So this was a baby step in some sense for us to bridge the gap between how we, who can see, uh, use Facebook and the people who actually can't see uh, want to experience Facebook and over time uh, we want to increase this capability so this is already running in production and there are millions of people who are blind who use Facebook and the amount of reaction we got just with this simple feature is just mind-boggling uh, the, the kind of experience they have now with Facebook than previously is just totally different you can imagine doing, doing this for videos you can imagine doing this in a much richer way so here is another example of where we are going to so here it's a talking image where a blind person is now interacting with a smartphone which is touch screen. Tree one, person one, tree one, snow, person one, person two, lake, person three, person four, tree two, snow, person four, skis. You get the idea. So now you have this more richer information that the, this person can interact with in the system. What if you want more information? What if the information that is available, you have more questions? So the next thing that we are developing, uh, which hopefully we will be able to provide to everybody, is you can actually interact with the system. So here is an example of visual question answering, where you are actually asking questions about the photo, if you are a blind person, for example. Is there a baby in the photo? Yes. Where is the baby standing? Bathroom. What is the baby doing? Brushing teeth. So here, uh, there is speech recognition. There is the computer vision part, understanding uh, what the question is, and connecting it to what it understands about the image. And then there is speech synthesis, uh, which is giving the answer back. All of these working in unison. And this is how, when we bring all of these technologies together, we'll be able to do really cool stuff. Now, obviously these questions are simple to us. We all know this because we can see it. But imagine you take any photo about, let's say I took a photo of Kremlin. This is, a, this is my first visit to Mar Moscow. I don't know the history. I don't need to go and search for Kremlin. I can basically say, give me more information about what I'm seeing. And then if it recognizes Kremlin, and it, recognizes, it gives you the history, and then I can keep asking more questions. Because it has built the knowledge about the world, it will be able to answer that question easily. So this, this is where we're going, right? Another example is uh, uh, building population density maps. One of the core uh, Facebook's mission is to connect everybody on the planet. Now, if you look at the census data for developed countries, it's very clear that the government and the organizations know where the people are. This is the density, population density map that we currently have, that we had before Facebook started helping. Uh, here, the resolution at which we have the density map is this. So we know that there are these many million people uh, in roughly this area, but we actually don't know uh, at, in detail where they are and what's the distribution. So how do we help here? You can use the computer vision models to actually build a much higher resolution maps on the, on the right. So this is a map of India. The government of India had resolutions in that scale where they knew across this thousand plus thousand kilometers we have these hundred thousand people who live but beyond that they don't have much other information so we take satellite imagery and we actually build classifiers for detecting roofs and houses from satellite imagery using the same networks and we use that we apply that on new satellite imagery and now we know where the houses are uh, we can distinguish between houses from deserts water forests and so on so that is now used as a proxy to understand where people are in developing countries. This is really crucial because now we not only know where people live, so this is a map of uh, population density map of Egypt, and you can clearly see there are a lot of settlements around the Nile River. Uh, we knew this, but now we know with more accuracy. So when Facebook 
or any other company for that matter want to help connect these people or deploy systems, uh, could be drones, could be installing special hardware, they, they know where to invest, which location to invest in, which parts of the world to invest in to, to help connect them. So this is one example. I don't know how many of you know Sri Lanka. This is a map of Sri Lanka which is much densely populated. Uh, and this is a map of South Africa. If you blindly uh, invest your energy uniformly, you would be losing, you would be doing an injustice to the people who are actually concentrated in specific areas. So using this population density maps, we are now able to provide customized solutions to high density areas and low density areas. So this is another application of using the same models that I talked about uh, for a different, uh, completely different solution, completely different problem. So there are two uh, uh, specific uh, research areas that I and my group uh, focus on. One is uh, uh, representation learning and the other one is semantic segmentation. I just want to touch base on certain results. Again, uh, the idea is not to get too technical in this presentation. If anybody is interested, you should definitely check out the papers that we publish. So in, in representation learning, one of the key problems is when we talk about uh, words like cat or dog or horse, they need to represent in uh, some space with a numerical representation. So the idea is you build uh, models to learn that in a in the best possible way. But you want to do it in a weekly supervised manner because if you sit down and annotate billions of annotations, it's going to be very expensive and it won't scale. So here the idea was to use the text uh, that people you, uh, gave around the image and build models. And once you do that, so here you're not specifically saying that's a photo of an airplane. You're basically just taking the entire text and learning the mapping from visual world to text. You get nice uh, models that can do this prediction. So given this image, it can predict vintage. Given this image, it can predict this is an abandoned. And these are all very difficult visual uh, uh, meanings, right? So how do you define abandoned? It's very hard. But the system is able to learn from millions of these examples because it knows an abandoned house probably has no people in it, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, one way of using weekly supervised data where you don't have to invest significant energy and cost in uh, annotating. So once you learn this model, you can basically take thousands of these images and project into the space that you have learned, and you can browse that space. So let's look at uh, how the space looks. So that's, that's the cat valley. So all the cats are close together, and uh, it's very interesting. Now you go to the dog dungeon, I guess. So a bunch of uh, dogs. Uh, you move on to a lot of photos that are uploaded uh, uh, which are food. So all the food is clustered. And then this is a flowers. So you get a sense. The model is automatically uh, basically compressing uh, similar looking uh, semantic elements in the same place. And the distance in the space is kind of giving you how similar they are. If two images are very far, they are dissimilar. And if two images are very close, they are very similar. And this, uh, the representation is learned automatically. Another, uh, you have already seen that what we are training for is not necessarily the problem we want to use the representation for. You can use that representation for a completely different problem. Like I trained for cat or dog classification, but I'm now using it for house or roof detection so that I can build population density maps. So it's really important to, so, so, so the current models are basically taking the examples on the left and passing it through this complex deep neural network or whatever model and asking, forcing the model to predict a certain class. So you're actually removing all the invariances which you might not want to because the feature that you're learning, you want to transfer it to some other problem. So we actually propose a new loss function called the magnet loss, uh, which is different to the existing loss functions, where the idea is not to force every uh, instance of a class to be together, but let it spread in the representation space where locally <coughs> there are clusters, but globally they can be uh, they can, they have the freedom to be uh, sculpted in whatever way. So the nice thing about this is that we told the system what is a shark, or what is a manta ray, or what is a gazelle, but then it automatically figured out that the manta rays in this case are in the deep ocean, and these are sharks in the deep ocean, and then it it figured out that there are there is another subclass in manta rays with manta rays with people. This was not annotated. The model automatically figured out that there is a subclasses uh, which manta rays with people uh, is actually closer to gazelles with people because in both cases there is an animal and a person. 
So the, the entire idea here is you want to learn a representation space that generalizes well, that preserves the semantics, not just does well on classification. <coughs> that kind of a representation will help you attack many more problems, not just a single classification problem. This is very crucial for us uh, when we, uh, when we uh, use the representation for many tasks. In case of semantic segmentation, uh, the idea is to label each pixel uh, with, is it a person, is it a tennis racket, is it a bird, and so on. So here are uh, the latest results from our system, which won the second prize in uh, uh, last December. So there are a few results which are mind-boggling. If, if you basically gave these results a few years ago, I would assume that a human annotated this. But these are all now completely annotated by the existing uh, deep networks. Uh, and this is semantic segmentation where it identifies that this is a person and all these pixels belong to the person. Here is a more tricky example. So here we wanted to find broccoli and it, it, it was able to individually find the broccoli in the food. And there are some failure cases which are tricky. And if, I don't know if you know, zebras actually evolved so that uh, when there is a herd, you cannot distinguish between one zebra and another, which is exactly where the existing system fails. But we hope to correct it over time. So I want to ask a quick question. Which of these bedrooms do you think are real? Anyone? No guesses? Yes? No? The top one, bottom one, left, right? None of them? Yeah, actually. None of them are real. So all of these are actually generated uh, by uh, a machine. Uh, so these, we have, we have a lot of work at uh, Facebook Air Research on generative models. And uh, this is using a combination of uh, discriminative and uh, generative models. It's called uh, adversarial networks. Uh, you, can, you can read more about them. Uh, it's called the LAPGAN paper. Finally, uh, it's not just about understanding what is in the image and video, it's also understanding the affordances in the real world and understand the physics. So here we train networks that look at this image, how many of you think that this set of blocks will fall or will, will stay as is? So we, we have a network that we train uh, where it predicts, given the configuration of the blocks, uh, whether the blocks will fall or not. So this is complete end-to-end -end training where it just looks at the image and predicts with some probability whether the blocks will fall or not. And it's inherently learning Newtonian physics. So where are we? I also want to put a plaque for uh, Vision Labs who kindly invited me and uh, that's why I'm in Moscow uh, who did a fantastic job on providing the uh, OpenCV bindings for Torch. We use Torch for research purposes at Facebook Air Research. And uh, they built uh, some really cool uh, image classification, gender, age prediction, and uh, describing images, uh, thanks to the bindings in OpenCV. So just to wrap up, where are we going with all of this? I showed you a bunch of uh, videos, demos, uh, talked about some computer vision applications. The real goal for Facebook AI research is we believe uh, when you remove the mundane tasks and give superhuman powers, uh, we can do that with the help of AI. You don't want to think about mundane tasks. You want to use your brain for more smarter things, right? So uh, our goal is to, like, like Jan said in the video, we think of cars as power for our legs. It's, it's a, it's, it basically enables us to move fast. In the same way, we think of AI as an enabler uh, for us to think fast, for us to do things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. I want to end uh, on that note. Thank you so much for listening.